We want to continue studying verse by verse through the book of Revelation in our series titled Racing to Revelation. And in doing so, we want to devote at least a couple studies to answering the key questions about our eternal heaven. So let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. It may be safely said that almost all liberal churches never teach what the Bible says about eternal hell. But let me hasten to add that most Bible-believing churches seldom teach about the eternal blessings of heaven. In fact, I announced a week ago that last Sunday I was going to teach on heaven, and instead I didn't finish my Wednesday night's message before, so I actually taught on hell last Sunday instead of heaven. And instead of the light of heaven, you got outer darkness, as it were. But why don't Bible-believing churches like Duluth Bible Church teach on heaven more often? I believe that while we preach repeatedly on the only way to go to heaven, by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, apart from works, rituals, or law, we don't teach on heaven much because until you reach the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, you really don't have an extended explanation of what heaven will be like. Yes, there's various statements and inferences and implications regarding heaven in both the Old Testament and especially in the New. But it's not until you come to Revelation chapters 21 and 22 that you have a detailed explanation of the believer's eternal home. And even then we read these chapters when we read these chapters, we oftentimes miss the implications of so many of its statements. But it's amazing what is really in the Bible about heaven if you are willing to study it out. And heaven is a very important topic. Don't you agree? May I ask, how many of you know someone who has died and gone home to be with their Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. How many of you have experienced the death of a saved loved one in the last two years? How about in the last year? Yes, yeah, some of you. Do you ever contemplate what they're doing right now in heaven? Do you ever think about what heaven is like? Do you ever think of what believers will be doing in heaven during the seven years of the tribulation on earth? Or what they'll be doing during the eternal state? And will there be similarities to life on earth today? Or, and what will be the significant differences? How do you imagine heaven to be like? A spaceless, timeless condition of floating on a cloud and harping a lot? Is there time and space in heaven? And who will be the focus of our eternal heaven? And what will be forever missing from our eternal heaven? And what will that mean? Have you ever wondered, what is the significance of receiving in the future a new glorified body at the, body, body, at the resurrection of the body? And does it even matter? Have you ever wondered... What will be, we'll be able to do and not do with these glorified bodies? Will we have our own homes in our eternal heaven? Will we recognize and identify people? Will we have relationships with others in our eternal heaven? Will we still be married? Some are saying yes, some are saying no. Perhaps. How will we relate to our redeemed family members in our eternal heaven? 
Will we have memory in heaven? And if so, how will we enjoy heaven while knowing some friends or family members are not there? Will we be discovering things in our eternal heaven? Will there be good angels in our eternal heaven? Can we talk with them? Get to know them? Is our eternal heaven a beautiful place? Will you be bored in heaven? You know, some people are deathly afraid of being bored in heaven. Will there be ethnic and national differences and entities in the eternal state? Will there be functional differences in service to the Lord in our eternal heaven? What language will we speak in our eternal heaven? You know, when I was in Poland, they said it would be Polish. You know why? They said it takes you all eternity to learn it. <laughs> Some of the Finlanders around here thinks it's going to be Finnish. You know why? Because Jesus on the cross says, it is finished. <laughs> Will we all live in the same place and be the same in our eternal state? You see, these are some of the questions we want to answer today and, and next Sunday, and we've got a few more questions beyond that as well. For you see, God wants us to know the truth, his truth, when it comes to heaven. In fact, can you imagine working for NASA and training for years to go to Mars and just before you lift off, one of your fellow astronauts says to you, what do you know about Mars? And you reply, well, not much. We've never studied or talked about it. I know it's where we're going, but besides that, I guess we'll find out once we get there. And that's unthinkable, but it's too often reality when it comes to our personal, biblical understanding of the place where we're going to spend eternity as blood-bought, born-again children of God. But keep in mind, dear friends, that we are in a spiritual battle between truth and error and between God and Satan. And before we were saved, what did Satan and his lies accomplish in your life? Well, Hebrews 2 tells us, inasmuch then... As the children have partaken of flesh and blood, you and I have flesh and blood. He, Jesus Christ himself, likewise shared in the same. He became a man. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And before you were saved, you were afraid to die, and so was I. And Satan actually used that to encourage us to get religious in many cases in order to try to atone for our sins through religious rituals and good works, failing to understand the truth of the gospel, how Jesus Christ died for our sins, and there was nothing left for the church or a ritual to do that he didn't already accomplish when he died on the cross for our sins past, present, and future. But Satan had us through fear all our lifetime subject to bondage. And this should not surprise us that Satan would do this thing because our Lord Jesus said, this of his arch enemy, the devil, and you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. And keep in mind that Satan hates the new heaven. And he hates the new earth. And he hates the new Jerusalem. As much as a deposed dictator hates the government that will one day take its place. And I believe that Satan in the present day wants to undermine both the biblical teaching about the glories of heaven and especially how to enter it, just like Satan will use the Antichrist in the future during the tribulation to spread lies about the glories of heaven as well. In fact, regarding the Antichrist, Revelation 13, 6 says, Then he, the Antichrist, opened his mouth in blaspheme against God. Now catch this. To blaspheme three things. Number one, his name. Number one, his tabernacle. What's that? Heaven. And number three, those who dwell in heaven. 
And so I am convinced that Satan and his wiles attack believers in Christ through distraction in some cases, but also through false information in others about the very place in which God wants to set our hearts and our minds. And I think this is one explanation for the Barna Research Poll results that states, an overwhelming majority of Americans continue to believe that there is life after death and that heaven and hell exist, but what they believe about heaven and hell varies widely. They are cutting the, and pasting religious views from a variety of different resources, television, movies, and conversations with their friends. So how can you and I separate the truth from the false? When it comes to the reality and glories of heaven? Dear brethren, the old hymn of the faith was spot on when it stated, How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith where? In his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said? To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. And so let's begin our study today by reading through and reviewing Revelation chapter 21, followed by many observations from this chapter and other verses, and answering the key questions about our eternal heaven. In verse 1, we're introduced to the eternal state by making reference to the new heaven and new earth. Verse 1, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. And as I pointed out in our past studies, the word new here is kainos. Kainos means new in quality and kind, in contrast to the old heaven, And the old earth. There is coming a day, dear friends, in which God will create a new heavens and a new earth, and as we'll see in a moment, a new Jerusalem. In his prophetic plan. Beginning in verse 2, we're introduced to the capital city of the new heaven and new earth, namely the new Jerusalem. In verse 2 we read, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. As we look at its features, we've noted that its name is the New Jerusalem in contrast to the old, and its nature is that it's holy and not sinful in contrast to the description of Jerusalem in Revelation 11, verse 8. And we observe its description as that of a city with all that's involved in a city. Though in many ways it's like a garden and a park as well. Verse 2 goes on to say, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So we see its descent is out of heaven from God. God. And this city is a prepared city. The perfect tense of prepared there means it's been prepared in the past with the results continuing in the present. It's prepared as a beautiful bride adorned for her husband. And as I've expressed already, it's my conviction that there, this is the very place that Jesus was referring to when he told his believing disciples that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So as you think of this place, let me use this hymn book if I could. Christ went to prepare a place for us in the Father's house, to add rooms on, as it were, for his bride, the church. This is presently in the third heaven. It's very possible during the millennial kingdom 
that it comes down and hovers over the earth and will be the abode of the church. But it's very clear here that in the new heavens and new earth that it comes down out of heaven and rests now on the new earth. And when someone dies today, this prepared place is where they go. In the third heaven, as absent from the body, is present with the Lord. And dear friends, you were created for a person and a place, a relationship with God that would last forever, and an eternal heaven as it were on earth. And what a comfort to know that if your faith is in Christ and you've been saved by the grace of God, that one day you're going to be with the Lord. And when someone dies who's saved, yes, there's sorrow, but there's comfort in that sorrow. Like with Bob Hodak, who just died last week, suddenly at the age of 53, dead. His funeral was Friday night up at Heritage Trail Bible Church. Randy Zempel presented the gospel Mike Weefel did the introduction and I did the close. And there were many people there that were without Christ. And interesting, Randy grew up in Aurora, Bob grew up in Aurora, and I grew up in Aurora. Now that is a display of the grace of God, to see all three, as it were, saved by the grace of God, and to meet people from Aurora that I haven't seen in years. And to think of the opportunity they had to hear the gospel. But as his casket was there before the pulpit, I was reminded once again that the real person was gone. This is just the outer shell. The outer shell was there. No need to hug the outer shell. The real person was gone. And those of you who have lost a saved mom or dad or a brother or a sister or a husband and wife, you can rejoice. They're far better today. And as I've said many times, none of them say, man, I sure wish I was in Duluth, Minnesota to freeze this morning. It is spring, isn't it? You know. You know, I love my saved mother's comment upon hearing from the doctor that she had less Within a week to live, with a sparkle in her eyes, she said to me, Dennis, just think, in a few days I'll be with Jesus. But as precious as it will be to be reunited with our redeemed loved ones who have gone on before us, keep in mind that when you think of heaven, that its supreme reality is the Lord God and fellowship with him forever is what heaven is all about. Verse 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his God, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Heaven, dear friends, will involve what the old hymn said, I want to see my Savior first of all. But heaven will be heaven not merely because of who is there, but also because of what is not present there. For verse 4 goes on to say, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Notice the excluded conditions from heaven, as it involves no more tears, death, sorrow, crying, and pain. Can you imagine that? What, a glo- what glorious conditions those will be. And remember that death today is no respecter of persons. Children who aren't even out of the womb yet die. Children right out of the womb at times die. Children die. On the other hand, some live to be a hundred or more. But you know, eventually they die And when put in perspective, Psalm 39 says, O Lord, help me understand my mortality and brevity of life. Let me realize how quickly my life will pass. Look, you make my days short-lived and my lifespan is nothing from your 
perspective. Surely all people, even those who seem secure, are nothing but vapor. And that's why it's so important to be eternally saved and have an eternally secured destiny of heaven because regardless of how long you live, it's just a bleep on the screen, that's all. It's just an intersection on the eternal timeline. It's just a vapor. It's here for a short time and gone. In fact, do you realize three people just died? Six, nine, twelve. And one day, that'll be you, apart from the Lord's return. You say, well, why did they have to die already? It's so short. Well, in reality, it's all short, regardless how long you live. But it's really the wrong question. The right question is if they're saying, why did they get to go to heaven already? In fact, I've wondered if God hasn't told us more about heaven if he would have told us more about heaven in the Bible, that maybe we'd be more prone to want to take our lives and go. Because who wants to stick around? Are you certain this will come to pass like this? Yes, verse 5 again says, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Notice it's summary statement of guaranteed future completion. These words are true. They are faithful. They're going to happen. God cannot lie. And he as God will do just what he has promised. You say, but who else will be in the new Jerusalem and who won't be there? Well, verse 6 says, And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes the believer in Christ shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Who won't there but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so as we think of heaven's occupants, though available to all who are thirsty, yet only the believer in Christ, the overcomer, will inherit all things, not the unsaved, who die with their sins unforgiven. You see, God is not willing any should perish. He wants all to be saved. Christ died for all. The Spirit of God was sent to convict the world. He's told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. He wants everyone in heaven. But He wants you to be willing to go and to go his way. And that's only one way, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. And you see, dear friends, as you think of this, he says, I will give as a gift of his grace of the fountain of the water of life, eternal life, freely, why is it free? Because Jesus paid it all when he died on the cross. And he offers it to those who thirst that are minus an eternal relationship with God. And they thirst for that because they were created to have that. So what's the difference between those who will occupy heaven and those who won't? Is it their personal merit? No, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Is it the rituals they perform? No, because not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. Is it some mystical experience they've had, like speaking in tongues? No, for without faith, it's impossible to please God. So what is the difference? The difference is there are those who have accepted Christ and his finished work and have had their sins washed away, and there are those who have not. And that's why Revelation 1 began in the introduction to remind us to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. But the word us in this context is speaking of believers. 
For you see the difference between heaven and hell, John 3 to 18, is he who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So if someone does not go to heaven, is it God's fault? No, not at all. It's their choice and their failure to respond to the truth of God they had. And that's why one day at the great white throne judgment, we recognize that they will be judged according to their works because in essence they have depended on their works to merit salvation as all religions teach that. And they have not placed their faith in Jesus Christ and their name was not written in the Lamb's book of life. Next, we observe that the New Jerusalem's glory is the glory of God, which is what all of creation, including man, was always designed to reflect. Verse 9 again reads, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, reference to John, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having what? The glory of God. This is the Shekinah glory of God's presence. Filled with spectacular light, for God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And with God's glory comes its radiance, which was like the most precious stone, like a jasper stone or a diamond, clear as crystals. So diamonds really are forever. What an awesome sight that must be. And that's not all, for its wall was great and high with 12 gates, with 12 angels manning the gate towers like watchmen, with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel written on them along with 12 foundations that have the names of the 12 apostles of the Lord written on them. The Lord is really into 12s here. This new Jerusalem is an amazing capital city of the eternal state, resting again upon the new earth like no other city that has ever existed on this planet in the past. Verse 12 says, Also she had a great and high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates And names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. An incredible city. With gates, with walls, with construction materials, with names written on the gates. The twelve tribes of Israel. With names written on the foundation of the twelve apostles of our Lord. And what is again the importance of the names mentioned? It indicates that the redeemed from Israel and the church will live together in the future in the new Jerusalem, though their distinction will be maintained throughout all eternity. It's a kind of meshing or merging of the blessings of our heaven with the blessings of the new heavens and new earth in the New Jerusalem. For remember, in Hebrews 11.10, those Old Testament saints looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. On the other hand, Jesus said to his disciples that he went to prepare a place for them and for us. A place. And where did he go? He didn't go to Jerusalem. He went to heaven. And now we have, in a sense, the merging of the two When the new Jerusalem calms down and is placed on the new earth. Now you might be thinking, well, that's a lot of people to fit into one city. The new Jerusalem, how big is this city anyhow? And again, we see its specific dimensions involves the shape of a cube, 
which is approximately 1,400 miles in length, height, and width, with walls that are 72 yards in length. Now, some think it could be a pyramid, but most believe it's a cube in shape like the most holy place in the temple, according to 1 Kings 6, verse 20. Approximately 1,400 to 1,500 miles each way. Height, width, length. 2,200 kilometers Being a cube, it could have over 600,000 stories connected to it. This is no small city. It could hold billions of the redeemed. On the ground level alone of the city is nearly 2 million square miles. 40 times bigger than England. 10 times bigger than France or Germany. And just think of how many children who died before reaching an age of accountability who at the point of death were redeemed, let alone those who trusted in the Lord later on to save them from the penalty of their sin. Revelation 21, 15 says, And he he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city is laid out as a square, its length is... It's as great as its breath, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Approximately 1,400 miles. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, 72 yards. According to the measure of a man, human standards, that is, of an angel. How big is that in relationship to our country? Now that is one big city. So you look at how it would look. And being cube shape gives you some idea what it might look like. And as I've said before, I'm convinced it's going to be right in the Middle East. Because God had promised the Jews that that land would be theirs forever. So I can't help but think that since the Jews that are saved will be there, that it it would most likely be in the Middle East. So what is our eternal home, the New Jerusalem, made of? Well, as we look at the building materials, again, the wall was made of jasper or diamonds, which is clear as crystal, verse 18. It says, the construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. Pure gold like clear glass. Spectacular. And this allows the glory of God to permeate every inch of this city at all times, as we will see. The foundation of the walls of the city were decorated with 12 kinds of precious, colorful stones. Verse 19, the foundations of the walls of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper or diamond. The second, sapphire. The third, chalcedony. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, sardius. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. The tenth, chrysoprase. The eleventh, jaceth. The twelfth, amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Now, if... If these precious stones appear like they do today, it would look on this order, except most people think jasper isn't this reddish color, but is actually in reference to diamonds, and that's what they were called in yesteryear. So you can see how colorful this is all going to be, and it's going to be very similar again to the breastplate that the high priest in Israel wore with the colors of the 12 tribes of Israel. And what about the pearly gates? Well, the 12 gates were 12 pearls, with each gate consisting of one pearl. We talk about the pearly gates, but it appears as though each gate is a pearl. Like none on earth today. 
Verse 21 ends by telling us that the main street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. In fact, verse 21 says, And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And this is where we get the streets of gold. Mentioned in many of our hymns. But is there a central place of worship in the New Jerusalem? The answer is no. Why? Because its temple is not a building for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple, verse 22. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. But what or who acts to illuminate this amazing place? Well, its illumination did not require the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God illuminated it, as the Lamb is its light. And again, verse 23 says the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it. It doesn't say it doesn't have a sun or a moon, but no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminated it, and the Lamb is its light. Next, we observe that its accessibility will be 24-7. To not only allow its residents full functionality, but to permit the saved Gentile people groups to walk by its means and for the kings of the earth to bring their glory and honor into it. Just think, accessibility 24-7 to this amazing place that has walls, pearly gates, but is never closed, totally safe, eternally secure, accessible 24-7, unlike so many places in our day. And again, who assesses it? accesses it. Verse 24, and the nations of those who are saved. And the word nations again speaks of people groups, primarily Gentile people groups, who are saved, not the unsaved, shall walk in literally by means of its light. And this is interesting, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And so we see here, this is an awesome and it's an amazing place. And as we think of this place, there are those who reside in this new Jerusalem. Who lives in it? the church age believers and the redeemed of Israel who live outside of it in the new earth but has access to the new Jerusalem the saved Gentiles the Adams, the Eves, the Abels the Jobs, the Noahs of life residency is here for us though we can access the new heaven and new earth Residency for them is the new earth, but they can access the new Jerusalem. But while there are those who live in the new Jerusalem and have access to the new heaven and new earth, while others live in the new earth and have access to the new Jerusalem, keep in mind that its visitors does not involve the unsaved, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. All the unsaved are cast into the lake of fire at the end of chapter 20. And that's why we read in verse 27, And there shall by no means enter in it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And notice again the contrast. We're talking about those who are saved versus those who are unsaved. We're talking about those whose names are written in the book of life versus those who are not. The unsaved are those who have never believed in Christ and never had their sins forgiven. And their names have never been written in the Lamb's book of life. And that's the book you need your name in. And according to Revelation 3, 5, to him that overcometh, I will never blot his name out of the book of life. You're saved and you're saved forever. 
And you know, I went over this purposely because we're just not familiar with this stuff. And it's easy to read these verses and understand their basic meaning, but fail to grasp the significance or implications of them. So with this chapter in mind, let's start to ask and answer some key questions about the eternal state. What are believers doing in heaven right now? Remember, Christ went to prepare a place for us. Where's that? It's in the third heaven in the Father's house. So what are believers doing there right now? That's a good question, isn't it? Well, let me give you a few answers. Number one, they are with Christ. What is Philippians 1? 21 through 23 tell us. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And Paul says that he has a desire to depart and to what? Be with Christ, which is far better. So they are with Christ. In fact, if you put a marker here and go with me to John 17... You say, well, what are they doing with Christ there? They are beholding Christ's glory. In John 17, what was his prayer? Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me, namely believers, may be with me where I am. By the way, does God answer the Son's prayers? Absolutely. And why does He want believers to be where He is? That they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. So what are believers doing today? They're beholding the glory of Christ. I could add, number three, they are enjoying the place that Christ went to prepare for them. John 14, verse 3. So what is that place like? Number four, it is paradise. In fact, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now I would assume, and I believe there's reason to believe, that in beholding Christ's glory, that there is worship going on, a sense of awe, a sense of amazement, a tr tremendous sense of grace. Because there will be memory in heaven, as I'll point out in a little bit. And to think of what you deserved and instead what you got as a gift of His grace is going to cause you to stand in awe for the Lord Jesus in heaven today is there with a glorified body and the nail prints are still in His hands and His feet to remind you of the payment He made to redeem you but in 2 Corinthians 12, we read in verse 1, It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, and this man, by the way, is Paul himself, such a one was caught up to the third heaven, the throne room of God. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into where? Paradise. And heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So he was caught up into paradise. The throne room of God, the new Jerusalem in heaven, is a place of paradise. But notice, it is a place. A place of paradise. A place 
to be enjoyed, a place where we behold the glory of Christ because we are with him. In fact, according to Luke 15, verses 7 and 10, did you know the angels are rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents? Now, as far as what else are they doing in heaven right now, there isn't a lot of Scripture. We do know, though, as we go to 1 Thessalonians 4, that the next event on God's prophetic plan is the resurrection rapture event. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, it says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, who have physically died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, first class condition, and we do, it's assumed to be true, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Question. For God to bring with Jesus Christ those who sleep, what part of the person sleeps? Well, the body. What part of the person is with the Lord? Well, the soul. So he brings back the soul at the resurrection in order to be united or reunited with the body. Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. What part of them? Their bodies. Resurrection deals with bodies. And you know, I was talking to a believer yesterday, and we were talking about this very thing. And he said, well, technically, the next event in God's prophetic timetable isn't really the rapture, it's really the resurrection. And that's true. Though oftentimes we combine the two. The dead in Christ, you see over here, I like this picture. See, these are the dead in Christ. Notice they're coming out of the grave. We'll rise first. Then we who are alive, notice this guy's still alive, and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet who? The Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another. How? With chocolate candies at a time of death. No. With these words. What comfort we find in these words. Now after this event, what will believers be doing in heaven during the tribulation on earth? Go to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. And here we've seen this scene in our study of the book of Revelation. A scene of worship before the throne of God. Verse 4, and around the throne of God were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders, I believe representative of the church, and they were sitting just like was promised to the seven churches, clothed in white robes, just like was promised to the seven churches. And they had crowns of gold on their heads, just like was promised to the seven churches. Now to have crowns on their, of gold on their head means they've had to be evaluated and rewarded. Thus, this is after the rapture, after the judgment seat. And what are they doing in heaven? Well, we see what they're doing. Verse 8, and the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, holy, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, these living creatures are some kind of angelic cherubim. What happens, verse 10, and the 24 elders fall down before him, who sits on the throne, and what do they do? They worship him, who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by 
your will they exist and were created. Now for the 24 elders to fall down requires a glorified, resurrected body that's functional. To cast their crowns before them requires a glorified body that's functional. And they're involved in worship in this point. And notice they're casting their crowns before the Lord, for this is their way of honoring the Lord and acknowledging all that they have by way of salvation and even all that they have by way of rewards is because of what the Lord did for them or in them or through them. So they're, what are they doing in heaven during the tribulation? They're casting their crowns. They're involved in worship. In fact, in Revelation 5, what do we see? Verse 8, And when he, Jesus Christ, had taken the scroll, the title deed of the earth, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints as they've been praying for this to happen. And they sang a new song. So there's worship, they're singing, and what are they saying? You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God. How? By your blood. Who are they giving worship to? Jesus Christ. And who was redeemed? They were redeemed out of every tribe and tongue and people and nations. Which again, I believe, involves the mortality rate of infants factoring into that verse. And have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign where? On the earth. Then I looked and I heard voices of many angels around the throne. There's going to be angels there. And the living creatures, these seraphim and cherubims. And the elders, the 24 elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times, 10,000, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such are in the sea and all that are in them. I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down, and what did they do? They worshipped him who lives forever and ever. And so we see this tremendous worship and singing and focus on God and focus on Jesus Christ and enjoying the company of the redeemed and enjoying the company of angels. Now look at Revelation chapter 6. Here. And what happens when the sealed judgments occur? The first half of the tribulation in which God begins pouring out his wrath upon the planet. Verse 9, I want you to just note this. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, now let me ask you, how can someone who died cry with a loud voice? How do they cry with a loud voice? Here are the people in heaven crying with a loud voice. How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. You know, Randy Alcorn in his book on heaven makes several notes about this passage. How notice they died and relocated to heaven. They maintained their identities. They were remembered for their lives on earth. They expressed themselves audibly in communication. They were with one voice which speaks of unity and shared perspective. They were fully conscious, rational, and aware of each other and of some information on the earth. They had an audience with God. They had a deep concern for justice and proper retribution. They remember they were martyred. And by the way, there must be time in heaven because they said, how long, O oh Lord, will it be till you avenge our blood? And they are able to talk with God. 
while they were there. Now that's not all. Go to chapter 8, verse 1. And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Silence in heaven. Why? Because apparently they receive information of what's going to happen on earth and they just sat in absolute awe. So there is some information being conveyed, at least at this time, and perhaps even now, of what's going on on earth. I wonder if they're up in heaven saying, where did that Malaysian plane go anyhow? I'm curious. I don't know. I don't know. Look at chapter 14. And again, this is all during the tribulation. Verses 4 and 5 speak of the church in heaven. 6 through 18 speak of the tribulation on earth. And look at chapter 14, verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. And by the way, is that not true today that you rest from your labors when you finally go to be with the Lord? And your works will follow you in the sense that you'll give an account one day and you'll be rewarded. Look at chapter 18 and verse 20. When we have the destruction of Babylon, that great harlot, in 17 and 18, look at verse 20. What are they told? Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Heaven is told to rejoice of some of the events that are going on on earth. Chapter 19, verse 1, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Why? For true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and he has avenged on her the blood of a servant shed by her. Again they say, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever, and the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah! And then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. So notice again, they, they have some knowledge of what's going on in heaven. For you see, as we think of the future, we're getting these glimpses, these small sound bites, as it were, leading up to Revelation 21 and 22 about what are believers doing in heaven right now? What will believers be doing in heaven during the tribulation on earth? And then will there be similarities and differences in the eternal state? And due to time, We'll have to pick it up next Sunday.